Now, without further ado, I'm going to introduce John Thompson, who is uh, completing his PhD at uh, University of Pennsylvania in Egyptology and is teaching, at, as we speak, uh, at BYU. And uh, it, well, I think, uh, having read his paper, we'll find some very interesting interactions here between uh, his paper and the other papers have been presented and those coming after. So John, we'd like to hear from you. Just a small correction, I'm actually not at BYU. Uh, I taught there for a couple of years, but I'm at the uh, Orem Institute of Religion at UVU. So it's okay, thanks. <clears throat> It's been a privilege for me to be here, and I'd like to thank the organizing committee, and particularly uh, Jack Welch. He's always, throughout my whole many, many, many years as a student, has always been very supportive of me and, and, um, and letting me participate in various publications he's done over the years, and, and now this conference, and, and so I appreciate uh, his willingness for, for the whole committee and in, in, uh, inviting me. I've enjoyed the remarks of those who have preceded me very much. Um, I find the whole attempt at recovering the uh, theology of the first temple period really exciting business. <clears throat> and I'm grateful uh, to William Deaver and, and Margaret Barker for their good work in this regard. My remarks will be directed toward the question of the lady's placement in the context of the temple and the bearing that this may have on Israel's temple theology. I believe we're all comfortable with Margaret Barker's argument that the lady as the tree of life and living waters was originally associated with the Holy of Holies. That certainly seems to be the case at the end of John's revelation. To complicate matters, there is evidence in the sources that I will discuss that the lady not only appears in the Holy of Holies, but she was also encountered in the courtyard outside the temple. Multiple encounters with the lady along the path of the temple raises questions about her meaning or purpose um, at each place in the temple's theology. Today, I would like to primarily explore her purpose in the courtyard. And in order to do so, I will um, kind of address some comparative material from Israel's neighbors, uh, particularly Egypt, because multiple encounters with female goddesses along the pathway of ascent to heaven is not unusual among them. Egyptian cultural influence in Israel was at one of its highest points during the late 7th century BCE, a highly relevant area, scholars believe, for the formation of the Old Testament books. And the Book of Mormon claims its uh, origins in Jerusalem during that time period as well. Additionally, recent research is demonstrating that the Old Testament temple tradition has much more in common with the Egyptian temple tradition than scholars have assumed, even from a very early date. Consequently, a comparative approach between these two cultures may be uh, fruitful. Of course, good scholarship requires that, uh, uh, that iconographic specifics be analyzed and understood within the context of their own culture to correctly ascertain their meaning within that culture and cautions against overreaching conclusions, for example, assuming that parallel symbols in two different cultures have parallel meaning, or assuming the direct influence of one culture on the other. However, swinging the pendulum too far the other way and ignoring the broader cultural milieu in which a society uh, existed may limit one's ability to fully understand the text or images that society produced. <clears throat> so like the Lady of the Israelite Temple, Egyptian female deities were associated with trees of life. In the early Old Kingdom, cult centers of Memphis and Komel Hissen, Hathor was referred to as the Nebet Nehet Reset, the Lady of the Southern Sycamore, a type of fig tree, and Nebet Imau, the Lady of the Date Palms. Saoasis, the wife of Atum in some myths, was closely related to the acacia tree. The iconography of the goddess the goddesses from the New Kingdom and later uh, will be the focus herein. And that's, of course, the time period in which the nation of Israel was formed and existed. During this period, artists depicted Egyptian female deities either merged with a tree in some way, you see this example here, 
uh, superimposed on trees, emerging from the branches of a tree, standing beside a tree, or having a headdress uh, or other icon uh, iconography representing a tree. My purpose is not to argue that tree goddesses exist in the sources, but to look closely at the details surrounding them to ascertain possible meaning. A close examination of the scenes reveals four details that I'll highlight today that occur frequently in relationship to the tree goddesses in Egypt. In the iconography of temples and tombs, Egyptian tree goddesses most often appear at the horizons, either uh, the western horizon where the sun sets or the eastern horizon where the sun rises. Entrance, entrances to temples and tombs can be seen as equivalents of horizons. And so here is a, the temple of Edfu, and the front pylon of this temple, as most, uh, most scholars would agree, is a stylized hieroglyphic for horizon. So the idea is that when you pass through the horizon into the temple beyond, you're in the afterlife, or you're, you're in, you know, beyond this world. The first tree goddess one encounters when journeying in the afterlife are those associated with the western horizon where the sun sets, equating with the mortal death. One of the more common scenes of tree goddesses on Theban walls of the New Kingdom era is the illustration of Book of the Dead 59, a spell that typically occurs near the beginning or the first hour of the netherworld journey. Such a scene appears in the tomb of Sinedjim, right here, uh, where he and his wife meet a tree goddess pouring a libation. That such a meeting appears to be initiatory prior to their journey into the netherworld is further justified by the fact that the tree goddess is depicted outside near the entrance of the temple tomb that appears below the couple. This scene from the tomb of Nefertiri shows Hathor with her frequent epithet, Lady of the West, as a cow goddess emerging from a tree to pour water from a heschar. The tree itself emerges from what appears to be a horizon glyph at the base. Hathor appears in the text as one of the first entities to greet the deceased on his journey into the netherworld. In this scene, um, uh, it appears to personify the West as a tree goddess, and the hieroglyphic above her head is the, the, uh, the hieroglyph for West pouring water at the horizon mountain. So the mountain you can see kind of going up on the left side there. And um, where Hathor, the goddess, the cow goddess, is emerging to greet him. And all of this takes place in front of what appears to be a tomb chapel entrance depicted in the lower left. Similarly, in this scene from the Book of the Dead, um, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. From Book of the Dead, spell 68, the spell used to release the soul to go forth by day. Um, this shows Hathor as cow goddess emerging from the horizon mountain amidst marsh plants outside the temple tomb, again suggesting interaction with the goddess near tomb entrances. In this one, from the tomb of Amun M. Ope, uh, the tree goddess is on the right there pouring water while growing from waters of a pool. On the left, the initiate is embraced by the goddess of the west at the horizon mountain and in front of a tomb chapel entrance. They're kind of cut off on the far left there. And then we saw this one earlier. Um, this, uh, just so you know the context of this particular scene, um, it's in, as mentioned uh, by Bill Deaver, this was in the tomb of Tutmos III and it is in the center of the room, and surrounding this pillar in the center is the 12 hours of the underworld journey. Because the, um, the tree is nursing a child, and that child is young, and the tree is placed in the center of the room, uh, one could interpret this then as the beginning of the netherworld journey. The Old Kingdom pyramid text of Pe Pepi the, the First seems to describe this moment and kind of prefigures it. When the deceased king comes to his mother goddess in the netherworld journey, she says to her son, accept my breast and suck from it that you may live. Though you are small, you shall go forth to the sky as falcons. And then the text continues. 
This peppy will go to the sky, to the high mounds, and to yonder high sycamore in the east of the sky, the bustling one atop which the gods sit. So here we have in the pyramid text then these two trees, the western horizon tree where he comes and he receives this, this nourishment, and, and, um, but she tells him that he's going to rise into the sky to a yonder tree in the east upon which the gods sit. The gods, as well as the deceased and other sources, sit in the top of the eastern trees like birds, prefiguring the tree in Ezekiel and the parables of the mustard seed, of course. This text in indicates that the movement for the deceased, newly born in the netherworld, is to leave his mother in the west, the western tree goddesses, and journey to the eastern sycamore. Book of the Dead 64 has deceased, the deceased exclaiming about this eastern sycamore, I have embraced the sycamore, and the sycamore has protected me. From the temple of Dendera, Hathor's face is depicted between the mountains of the horizon glyph. And there you see, again, what William Deaver was telling us about her hairstyle. Uh, so this is Hathor's face. In between the mountain, again, the horizon glyph. Uh, and then on the mountain tops, right, you have these tree motifs appearing in connection with uh, the mountains, and the newly born uh, sun's ray shining down suggests the eastern horizon. Okay, so now we're moving to the next detail. So the first detail was, um, again, the western focus on the western horizon primarily, and that we have engagements with, with the tree goddesses twice, once in the west, once in the east. Now we're going to look at sacred trees as mothers. So in this scene, Newt is shown standing in the midst of a tree, offering a tray of figs and water from a hess jar, and is described as the one who gave birth to or is the mother of the great gods in the text at the very base of the tree there. Labels declaring the motherhood of the tree goddess are common, and I could just multiply lots of pictures, but... We'll move on. Um, and then once again, we go back to this scene. Um, again, placed on the pillar in the middle chamber, surrounded by the 12 hours of the underworld journey. Here, the, the, uh, it depicts the king suckling at the breast of an anthropomorphized tree. The text indicates that the tree, the text on the left there indicates the tree is his mother, Isis. And then this fragmentary uh, scene doesn't really tell us too much, but we do have... Um, a lady, and you can see the tree branches in the back, and again, she's suckling um, her child. So what do these mother tree goddesses of the West do? So the third detail. A frequent detail already seen is that they pour out water for the recipient who approaches the tree. This scene, which was shown earlier, appears in the 19th dynasty tomb of Senegem in Deir el Medina, Originally a vignette for the Book of the Dead 59 and portrays the goddess Newt with her lower torso merging with a tree trunk, not only presenting a tray of fruit and other goods, but also pouring water from a hess jar into the hands of the deceased. It's kind of hard to see, but um, right above their heads is little wavy lines, and, the, and then that's you know where she's pouring out that, that liquid refreshment. Here that the water, uh, you can see that the water for, is for drinking and not merely caught in the hands is made clear from images such as this one where the tree goddess, in this case Ma'at, offers a tray of goods and pours water into the hand of the recipient which is held up to the mouth. This example clearly has the water flowing across the hands and into the mouth of the recipient. So in addition to flowing vases, divine tree goddesses are often depicted in relationship to pools of water, as here. Um, the, the goddess emerges from a tree pouring water that grows near a pool complete with fish, lotus plants, and a boat shrine. In this scene, um, it demonstrates that not only the tree goddesses vase, but also the closely associated, associated pools of water can be sources for drinking. Tree goddesses with flowing vessels are also attested in Near Eastern art, such as the seal impression from Mesopotamia of an earlier period. Not only does the scene depict branches emerging from the goddess's body, but traces of a plant emerging from the vessel are preserved as well. 
All right, the fourth and final detail. Some scenes from Egypt portray the goddess not only pouring a libation for, for drinking, but the streams also appear to fall in front of and behind the individual, as in this figure here. This would indicate that the water is also for cleansing or purification. This is clearer in this scene, uh, where the streams of water are poured over the top of the head from behind, which in Egyptian canons of iconography is a representation of purification. The, the hieroglyphic wab, which means purify or to purify, is actually a seated man with a jar above his head and water pouring in front of him, just as you kind of see here. Um, and note again the tomb on the bottom right there. So he's being purified prior to entering into the tomb. That the goddesses are typically shown pouring water from a hess jar in all the examples is also significant for such jars are typically used for ritual purification throughout Egyptian history. Okay, a common placement of the scenes of tree goddesses in the New Kingdom non-royal tombs is next to offering tables. So, so where do we find these tree goddesses often in these non-royal tombs is that she will appear, as I mentioned, next to offering tables. For example, in the tomb of, of Naked, in the era, the era of Tutmos IV, the goddess with a sycamore emblem on her head appears twice, flanking both sides of an offering table. In later periods, the goddess appears directly on offering tables, so depicted on the table itself, with libation areas carved on the table. I don't have examples to show you, so I'm sorry about that. Um, and in addition to that, Book of the Dead 59 is inscribed on it as well. Libation is the first rite of the royal and non-royal offering lists from the earliest of times, all the way back to the pyramid texts and even earlier, and is made for the purpose of purifying the deceased. Likewise, in Mesopotamia, we have this uh, 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 panel from Mari uh, portraying the goddesses with vases at the, in the bottom uh, rectangle there. Which, with plants and flowing water emerging in a preparatory purification area, where the recipient, who is shown in the above investiture chamber, was first cleansed. And, and you can go read Jeff Bradshaw's article on this in the, uh, uh, the Bible and Antiquity uh, uh, journal that BYU publishes. Okay. So, this idea of, again, encountering goddesses prior to entering into the sacred areas. The, the nature of comparative studies is that it can help one see things in one tradition because of its appearance in another. The four specifics in the Egyptian tradition concerning goddesses as trees of life that I have just outlined above, or previous, <laughs> are uh, also appear in the Israelite sources. So like the Egyptian tree goddesses, divine trees in Israelite sources are also closely associated with, closely associated with sources of water. Genesis 2, 8 through 9, indicate the tree of life came out of the ground in the midst of the garden, but then immediately indicates that a river also went out of Eden to water the garden. And then it parted and went into four heads. Ezekiel 31 and Revelation 22 portray the river as a fountain coming up as a spring from the deep, from under the threshold of the temple, or from beneath the throne and tree. Evidence in Genesis that we can't go into suggests that the river begins as a fountain there as well. Though a tree and fountain exist in Genesis' garden, the relationship between the two, while explicit in the Egyptian images, is not readily apparent in the Genesis account. However, the other Israelite sources do indicate some relationship. In Ezekiel 31, the fountain or spring from the deep causes the great tree to grow mightier than all the other trees that were in the garden of God. The much later Midrash, uh, Genesis Rabbah, uh, mentions that the uh, waters branched out under the tree. Likewise, the tree in Revelation can be understood as having its roots in, in and around the river. So there seems to be some interaction. But again, the Egyptian accounts, the tree is the source of water, right? It's, it's the goddess pouring the water. So closer to the Egyptian examples, which combine um, the tree and the flowing water, uh, we have the text in Ben Sira, which has the tree speaking as if she is both a source of fruit and water. So come to me and eat your fill of my fruit. Those who eat of me will hunger for more and those who drink of me will thirst for more. So this is the tree speaking about providing drink, right? 
Likewise, the Book of Mormon blurs the distinction between the tree and the fountain. Nephi indicates that the rod of iron led to the fountain of living waters and then immediately adds, or to the tree of life. Both, he explains, represent the same thing, even God's love. The tree of life in Alma, that grows up from a seed planted in the heart, appears to be a fountain also. And ye shall feast. Um, well, sorry, I'll do this one first. So come unto me. So Alma, if I... Oh, that's weird. It was me. Sorry about that. So come unto me, and ye shall partake of the fruit of the tree of life. Yea, ye shall eat and drink of the bread and the waters of life freely. And then, of course, we have in Alma 32. And ye shall feast upon this fruit, even until ye are filled, that you hunger not, neither shall you thirst. And the interesting, when you compare Ben Sirah with Alma 32, one is that if you drink and eat, you will hunger for more, right? But I think that that's not a contradiction. I think Alma 32 is saying, okay, you want more, so feast, right? And keep drinking and keep eating until you're filled. <clears throat> the Egyptian examples explicitly show those who approach the tree goddess drinking the water that she pours out. None of the biblical examples portray one approaching a tree to drink. However, again, Ben Sira has the tree of life as wisdom, inviting those who desire to, her, to come to her eat and, to eat and drink. Right? Come to me and eat your fill of my fruit. Those who eat of me will hunger for more. Oh, we already did this. Okay. So likewise, in the Book of Mormon, Alma indicates that partaking of the tree will, again, satisfy hunger and quench thirst. So just that small detail, right? Yes, the, the tree is both water and food, but they're actually drinking and eating this tree you know, uh, symbols. All right. So Israelite sacred trees as mothers. Much of the tree goddess examples attested in the ancient Near East emphasize their sexual nature as consorts to male deities. However, the Egyptian examples emphasize their role as mothers um, rather than sexual consorts. References directly equating divine trees with motherhood do not appear in the Old Testament. Um, however, okay, so divine trees as mothers... However, uh, so explicitly in the Old Testament, you don't see trees as mothers. Um, but references directly equating divine trees as motherhood. Uh, however, I will defer to the work of Margaret Barker, of course, who demonstrates that such a relationship does in fact exist. However, I want to emphasize one point. As she spoke on Revelation 12, the early Christian reflection of this idea uh, speaks of the lady clothed in the sun who gives birth to a royal child who rules with a rod of iron. Interestingly, the vision of Nephi in the Book of Mormon not only equates the tree of life to a virgin mother who gives birth to a child, as Dan Peterson pointed out many years ago, but upon closer reading, the child of Nephi's vision, like the child in Revelation 12, appears as a king ruling with a rod of iron. When Nephi desires to know the meaning of the tree that his father, Lehi, saw, he was shown a vision of a virgin who is described as the mother of the Son of God. Um, after the man of the flesh, and I looked and beheld the virgin again bearing a child in her arms. This vision immediately gives way to another vision of this son of God going forth among the children of men, and I saw many fall down at his feet and worship him. Nephi then declares, I beheld that the rod of iron which my father had seen was the word of God, which led to the fountain of living waters or to the tree of life. And so we have... Jesus, I think, or again, the Son of God here, being depicted as um, a king, people falling down at his feet as he holds the rod of iron uh, that Nephi then identifies its meaning for us. Elsewhere in the Book of Mormon, Nephi's brother Jacob quotes an ancient prophecy by the, a man named Zenos, who refers to a great central olive tree in a vineyard as the mother tree. He refers to it over and over again. Other trees are formed from her branches, and the resulting branches of the other trees are eventually grafted back into this mother tree. The mother tree and other trees perhaps echoes the Genesis garden and Ezekiel uh, temple uh, with their main divine trees and the other trees of the garden. So the Egyptian tree goddesses appear at the western horizon. I guess we'll move on to the next. So they appear at the western horizon or entrances to the netherworld, or at entrances to temples and tombs. Evidence points to divine trees near the entrances to temples in Israelite sources as well. 
Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy explicitly forbids the Asherah from, from being erected next to the altar. Of course, the question is, which altar? Um, however, the uh, Genesis account mentions Abraham building an altar at the Oak of, of, of Moriah, uh, where God had appeared unto him in Genesis 12, 6, and later plants a t- tamarisk tree in Beersheba, where he calls upon the name of God in Genesis 21. So this, this idea of Abraham building an altar next to a tree, um, it doesn't mention sacrifice here, but the, the assumption is that we, that we have, you know, again, because it's an altar that is built, um, more than likely a sacrificial altar. So not an altar in the temple, but the temple altar is outside. Um, Joshua sets up a covenant stele under a tree near the temple. And in Psalms 92, and cross-referencing with 52, likens the righteous to trees planted and flourishing in the courts of the temple. These examples suggest the possibility of a tree in the courtyard connected to the altar before the door of the temple. Like unto the lady at the horizon in the Egyptian material. Ezekiel has the fountain of life coming up from beneath the threshold of the door of the temple, not in the Holy of Holies, that flows to the trees outside the temple. Trees and waters of life motifs are also present at the door of Solomon's temple. The brazen sea was not just a bowl of water, but a bowl with gourd-shaped knobs all around and shaped like a lily blossom, according to 1 Kings. Consequently, the priests were washing in a plant-shaped basin. Further, the pillars on the porch flanking the door of the temple were tree motifs, having capitals that were lily-shaped with pomegranates hanging therefrom. The text of the Book of the Dead 59, the spell that most often accompanies these western tree goddesses, alludes to the Hermopolitan myth concerning the birth of the sun, and versions of this myth portray the sun rising from a lotus blossom that itself was first rising out of the primordial waters. So this is the image. So again, you have the waters where it's born, but it's born out of a a plant coming from the waters. And so that's the head of Ray there, so the sun god coming up. The tree of life in Lehi's vision, Nephi's virgin, from the Book of Mormon appears to be at the end of a journey, at the end of a path, as if one finally enters into eternal life. However, the fact that many arrive at the tree, partake, and then... Uh, and then leave due to mocking of those in the great and spacious building suggests that not all trees of life are the actual end of one's eternal journey, like the tree of the heavenly city in Revelation. This uh, tree seems to be an initiation prior to testing. There is a sense in some of the sources when partaking of the tree of life prefigures or foreshadows the moment of actually partaking of eternal life for real. However, a path of enduring trial and persecution lies between the initial partaking of the tree and truly partaking of its fullness in the heavenly city. Likewise, one can partake but then forsake the fountain of wisdom in the book of Baruch um, 3. All right. Not only do the waters of Egyptian tree goddesses give life, but they also purify. In the Israelite sources, Abraham calls upon and encounters God in relationship to trees. And in Genesis 18, Abraham dwelling among the oaks of Mamre, and sits sitting in the doorway of his tent, welcomes three holy men by stating, let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. While viewed by some as a simple act of desert community uh, hospitality, the act of washing feet and resting under a tree at the door of a house after a journey certainly reflects the Egyptian material as well as the priestly washings of hands and feet in lily-shaped bowls at the foot of the tree-like pillars with hanging pomegranates at the door of the temple. Gnostic texts indicate that baptism, a purification rite, occurs in the fountain of the living waters. The baptizers immerse him in the spring of the waters of life. The Book of Mormon also connects partaking of the tree of life with baptism. Unto those who do not belong to the church, I speak by way of invitation, saying, Come and be baptized unto repentance, that you may also be partakers of the fruit of the tree of life. It's difficult here to ascertain if Alma is saying that baptism proceeds, Partaking of the tree of life, where baptism is the equivalent of partaking of the tree of life, but in light of the broader cultural parallels, the latter is a strong possibility. Okay. So, in conclusion, the Egyptians viewed their ancient or their ascent into heaven as a journey or progression that begins at the western horizon, 
And this horizon corresponds with mortal death, the setting of the sun, but was also viewed as a birth into a new life in the hereafter, a transition. At this initial transition point, the deceased encounters the Lady of the West, or the Lady of the Horizon. Because the deceased is being reborn into a new life, the goddess, depicted as a tree pouring water and growing near garden pools, is labeled as a mother and even nurses her child. Since the sun and the world, as the ancient Egyptians portray it, came out of the primordial waters of noon just as a baby comes from a watery womb, the mother goddess is closely associated with waters of life. As a baby who comes forth from the waters of the womb is considered pure, so the deceased is pure when born into the hereafter as symbolized in the streams of water that the tree goddess pours uh, around the individual. The deceased also drinks from the water she pours or from the milk of her breast in order to live and to have power to make the journey to the eastern horizon as Book, uh, per, Book of the Dead 59 and Pyramid Text 470 state. Another world birth, nursing, nourishing, purity, would explain the appearance of a woman as a mother who nurses or pours water and purifies at the horizon mountain or at entrances to tombs. However, this initial birth is not the final destination. There is a, an ascension as falcons to the eastern horizon where the high sycamore tree goddess is met and embraced, suggesting another birth or transition, even a resurrection where the deceased is illuminated in the dawning rays and rises with the sun god ray. The symbolism of this journey or ascent into the sky becomes intertwined with the main offering ritual sequence of temples and tombs in ancient Egypt, forming their temple theology. The appearance of the western tree goddess in the New Kingdom tombs and later in connection with the tomb chapel offering tables with libation vessels and food depicted thereon relate her to the sequence of rites performed there. The initial part of this sequence includes a libation of water including uh, followed by an opening of the mouth and eyes and ears and nose by means of a natron washing followed by a small meal. Indeed, the libation and opening of the mouth rites are viewed as a birth by the ancient Egyptians. So the presence of the mother figure is expected and indeed does appear in the texts related to these rituals. In the Israelite temple theology, we can see a similar pattern. The sources above indicate the courtyard of the temple may be one location that the tree goddess motif in ancient Israel once appeared. The lady as a tree seems to have appeared in connection with the sacrificial altars in the Abraham material as well as in Deuteronomy, just as she appears in connection with initial offering tables in the Egyptian theology. Being in the courtyard, she would also be associated with the waters of the laver, a place where priests were purified prior to the ascension into the temple, just as the tree goddess in Egypt poured water and purified the deceased prior to entering the horizon or the tomb. Indeed, the laver in the courtyard and the pillars of the porch in Solomon's day have trees and flowered decor, possibly reflecting the tree and fountain of living water. Consequently, the lady in the courtyard would indicate the courtyard was a place of transition prior to entering the gate, even a rebirth into the life of holiness represented by the holy place. The early Christian church certainly seems to view the courtyard as a place of rebirth. Matthew, Matthew's Jesus interprets the two messengers in Malachi 3 as John the Baptist and himself, the Lord. John is the ironic messenger in the courtyard who prepares the way, while Jesus is the Melchizedek priest and messenger of the covenant who will come to his temple. John prepared the way to the temple by teaching repentance and baptism, a ritual of being born again of water, echoing the altar of sacrifice and labor in the courtyard. Jesus administers the blessings of the covenant inside the temple, which John declared would include another birth, or even births, of fire and the Holy Ghost. Like the Egyptian theology of at least two births, one of water in the western horizon and the other in the east with a sunrise, the Christian temple theology also promises at least two births, one in the courtyard of water and the other of fire or the spirit in the temple. At the beginning of John's record, Jesus is baptized through John. And then we find him going and appearing to the woman at the well where he says to her, give me to drink. And when approached by a woman, um, you know, so it's interesting, he's asking her for the drink at the outset because that, again, is her cultural um, place as the, the life giver in the desert. She pours the water out, but as the dialogue progresses, Jesus reverses the roles and places himself as the water giver. If thou knew the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldst ask him and he would have given thee living water. And so we see Jesus reversing the roles, at least at this point, taking upon himself, as it were, those, the symbols of the mother of the, the first birth, right? 
At the end of John's record, as we get to the second birth concept, so Jesus' baptism, and matter of fact, I wish I could have time to just talk to you about how the whole book of John is following the steps of the temple as John teaches us about Jesus as water and of this, as the sacrifice, and then he takes us as, as he's the light to go into the holy place, he's the lamp, he's the, you know, and then eventually um, at the end um, of his record, it is women who swirl around the transition of Jesus from death to resurrection. It is a woman Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, who anoints Jesus with costly oil, an act that Jesus declares was related to his burial. At the moment of his death, Jesus calls attention to his mother, woman, behold thy son, and to his disciple, behold thy mother. The very next moment, John records, interestingly, that Jesus says, I thirst. I wonder what his mother, the supreme mortal personification of the tree of life and living water, was thinking as she stood helpless while her royal son ironically died on a man-made tree of torture and received vinegar instead of cool, fresh, living water. Those are the two things that John records at the crucifixion. And then John's description of the actual burial and resurrection can be read as a birth. As Jesus' body is placed in a garden tomb, which is virginal, wherein never was man yet laid. And Jesus presumably comes forth naked, indicated by his linens left neatly folded behind as if to call attention to that very point. Finally, it is a woman who is the first to see the newly born Son of God. So the lady is there at the beginning, representing the initial birth of baptism and preparation for entering the temple. And she is at the end as we are born into eternal life and resurrection. Thank you.